Project Inspire would like to thank our generous partners and sponsors for their ongoing support and for making this year's Tisha B'Av presentation possible. Gourmet Glot of Cedarhurst and Brooklyn, worth the trip from anywhere. Funding Resources Mortgage Corporation, we put the truth in lending. May the chizuk and inspiration of this year's film presentation be Le'iloi Nishmas, Iyal ben Uriel, Yaakov Naftali ben Avram, and Gilad Michael ben Ophir. Hashem Yinkoim Damam. This year's presentation is L'schus Rafur Shalema for Tzila Bas Chana, B'Soich Sha'ar Chayle Yisrael. It's Tisha B'Av, yes, another Tisha B'Av. 1,944 Tisha B'Avs since Churban Bayez Shani. Nearly 2,000 years of mourning. But what is mourning? Is it just tears? Is it just resolve? We believe that it's more than that. We try to use Tisha B'Av as a vehicle, as a medium, to inspire us to be better people. That's probably why you're watching this today. The Gemara Yuma tells us, Navtes, that the Bayi Sheni was Nechrav because of Sinas Chinam, baseless hatred. We all know that. And we hear it year after year after year. And the question is, is there something that we can do about it? That's why we come to you this year with that message, and the message is yes. This year, Klal Yisrael finds itself in a particularly difficult time. It was just weeks ago that Klal Yisrael was united in tefillah, in hope that we would find our missing three teenagers. Naftali, Ayal, Gilad. We were looking for them and hoping, hoping together that they would be found alive and well. But the Midas Hadin said no. And then, came Operation Protective Edge. And we davened and davened, davened for our fallen soldiers and davened for all of our soldiers and davened that this terrible period should be over, never again to be repeated. So perhaps this year in Tisha B'Av, we have even more reason, we have even more interest in doing something different something that will unite all of us, something that will make a difference. In previous years, we showed you segments, vignettes, of people who did wonderful things, things that clearly increased Avas Yisrael. And so many of you watched and so many of you were inspired. As a matter of fact, some of the people who were inspired actually appeared on subsequent films on Tisha B'Av because of the amazing things that they did just as an inspiration and a result of seeing a Tisha B'Av film. But today, I think we have something very special, something a little different, a little unique, a story that when I saw it and when I experienced it, I said, this is something that everyone should see. And today, we proudly are able to show you that film. We always have a rabbi of great prominence, a rav in the community, a rav known in Klai Yisrael introduce the film. And today it's a great privilege to have Rabbi Moshe Tuvia Leif, the Mar Da Asra of Agudis Yisrael based in Yemen, who's going to introduce our film, but in a little bit of a different way. Because this year, the rav, Rabbi Leif himself, has a story to tell, a personal story, that one that everyone here can relate to. One that I think in and of itself will inspire each of you. Chazal teaches, Talmidei Chachamim Marvim Shalom Ba'ilam. That the personification of a Talmud Chachem is someone who 
doesn't just pursue peace, but increases Sholem in the world. of the previous generation asks, does that mean that an individual knocks on his neighbor's door and says, I'm a Talmud Chochem, I have smicha, yere yere yodin yodin, heard you fighting last night, and I'm a Talmud Chochem, a bona fide mar b'shalom b'olam, let's work it out, let's create a counseling session for you and your wife, or for your children, is that what it means, mar b'shalom b'olam? Explains of Chatzkel. An individual has kapedis, he's upset, he's nervous, he's angry, because he doesn't really feel a sense of fulfillment in life, with all the money and acquisitions that he has. But a Talmud Chachem has such a sense of wealth, Baal Yeshua, with his blat gemare, worth more than a billion dollars to the extent that he overflows with a sense of contentment. He has purpose in life. And the Talmud Chachem, through his blat gemara, infuses his wife with shalom, his family, his neighbors, his friends, his community, his kehila, his city, the world. Talmud Chachem and shalom ba'olam literally means that there's an overflow of shalom that permeates the world and affects the world because of that Talmud Chachem. The Vilna Goyen Zatzal compares the consummate pedagogue to a large kais surrounded by smaller kaisas. And they are filled by the overflow, the enthusiasm, the charisma, the excitement that an Eril Chayud generates at the end of the day affects the world. And we as B'nai Teirah and B'nai Aliyah, those who have come to watch this video of inspiration, to be moved, to be inspired, to grow on Tisha B'Av, to inspire others, are the Talmidei Chachamim of the door. The Bnei Torah, the Bnei Torah that are charged with this mandate uniquely in our generation. Not to run around peddling peace, not to broker any kind of counseling amongst warring parties, but just to create a genre, a sense of excitement, contentment that spreads to others. About two years ago, my Rebetzin and I, Morabela, left our home Shabbos morning to go to shul. As we walked out the door, we sensed that it was raining. And right in front of our house was a sleek black Mercedes Benz. The driver was valiantly trying to start the car, and he wasn't successful. I looked inside and I saw he was a nice Italian boy handsome fellow, personable. So I made a comment to him. I said, I hope the rest of your day is better off than the way it started. And as we're walking away, he tells me, Shabbat Shalom. I look at my wife, incredulously. We start walking away. Shabbat Shalom, this was not a non-Jew. This was a member of our faith. We walk about two blocks and I turn to my wife and she turns to me and at the same time, we said the same thing simultaneously. I'm going to be late for sure. I pride myself on being the untimely believe that, but I will be late for sure. But what is the chance, that a Jewish fellow on Shabbos gets stuck with his Mercedes Benz right in front of my house, blocking the driveway. So we walk by and we walk back. And we turn to this fellow and I say to him as follows, I know it sounds absurd, I started talking to him in Hebrew because he was a Sephardi Jew or an Israeli. So I turned to him and I said something that to him was probably ludicrous. Why don't you leave your things in my home, your keys, your phone, and come to shul? We'll show you a good time. We'll give you chamin shalant. You could spend the day with us. He says, it's impossible. I've got to open my store on Flatbush Avenue in a couple of minutes. My wife is going to go crazy not knowing where I am. How can I just fall off the face of the planet for the next four or five hours? I said, I know it's absurd, but look at the hashkoche right in front of the rabbi's house. That's where your car breaks down. Come with us to the Bet Knesset. And he does that. He leaves his phone and his keys in the closet. And as we're walking to shul, he starts telling me his life story. 
He was born in Syria, and miraculously in the 80s, they got out to Israel. He served in the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, ended up in America, married a girl from Boston. Now he lives on Avenue Y, near Ocean Parkway, in a non-religious neighborhood. And he's excited to come with us to Shul. We walk in the door. I'm several minutes late. I sit him down, front row, right in front of the Bema. My good friend Rabbi Gross was there with an art scroll sitter, showing him the place. I get up to speak before, Kabbal, before Kriya Satira. And I tell the Yalem, I want to apologize for being late. But the reason why I was late this morning was because I met a fellow, his name is Chaim, and he's coming to shul for the first time. And I tell him a bit of the story and the conviction of a man who's real and decides this is the opportunity of a lifetime. And he came to David. So I welcome Chaim and I ask Chaim to stand. Over 300 men, and I'm sure the women in the Ezra Nashim stood up. They gave him a standing ovation for five minutes. He opened up the Aaron Kaidish for Psychas He told me afterwards he felt like the red carpet was rolled out for him and that he was a superstar. Everybody came over to him after davening to congratulate him. He came back to us for Shabbos lunch. I took a nap. When I got up to go to shul, he was gone. And I thought that was the end of the story. That week, Morabela, my wife, my Rebetzin, gets a phone call from his wife. Thank you so much for having my husband. I've been looking for an occasion to connect. That sukkah they came and they spent with us, a suda together in the sukkah. They brought a bottle of wine. And I've got to tell you, that two years later, Chaim lives in the Torah community of Flatbush. He shemit Torah as mitzvahs. His wife goes to Shiurim, and he sends his children to Torah schools. You know, often at a levaya, Rachman Litzlan, you hear people saying, if it starts to rain as they're burying the nifta, the heavens are crying. Shemaim is crying for this nifta. I look back and I say, Shemayim was crying. It was raining, but it was not tears of sorrow, it was tears of joy. Because that Shgoche protest, right in front of my house, this Mercedes Benz gets stuck. He can't restart the car, he's calling AAA, they're not responding. I was told by a good friend of mine that when I came back to him, he thought, that I was going to tell him, get your car out of my driveway. This is Brooklyn. But to be invited for Shabbos, this was not an opportunity of a lifetime for him, but for me. I'm no guru when it comes to Kirov. I lived in Minneapolis for 19 years. We grew a Torah community. I lived in Fatbush for five years. We're continuing to grow a community of Torah of Mitzvahs and Chesed. But every single individual has those opportunities in the course of his lifetime to go back and to say, I'll be late. It might not be the easiest thing in the world, but there's some reason why I met this fellow. There's some spark and nisham in him that could be turned on. Could you imagine if I kept on going? Could you imagine if we said, well, I'm going to be late for shul, and you can't make a chal of being late for shul? At the end of the day, this family would have been lost. But the chesed elian, their lives were turned around. The Chovetz Chaim had an incredible maisa. Many people say, who am I to be makarav? I'm not an expert. I don't know Kola Kula. How can I respond to questions of Hashkafe? The Chavetz Chaim Zatzal spoke in Vienna a few years before he was nifty. He was very feeble and ill. He got up and he said to a group of 2,000 yeshiva bachram who were aged 16 and 17 and 18. And he said, there's a fire burning of Haskola, of so-called enlightenment, and you've got to quench that fire by learning Torah and by bringing people closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You have this Achrayas responsibility. And as he was being escorted and literally carried out, another Chosh of God got up and said, Chavetz Chaim's Shlita, of course, doesn't mean you. He means when you're 20 and 30 and 40, you're accomplished, Lamdonim, then you go out and be Makarov. Chavetz Chaim heard these words and asked to be taken back. And he spoke again. And he says, no, I'm speaking directly to you. And he told a story 
of a Paritz who came to visit his villagers, Yidin. And he comes to the supervisor of that particular derful, and he gives him a glass of tea. And he starts drinking the tea and he says, his nose wrinkled in distaste, this water is swampy, silty. How do you offer people this water to drink? So the Paritz has this response from the supervisor, what should we do? What should you do? You gotta purify the water, homogenize, pasteurize, perfect it. Supervisor makes a vow. He says, I promise that from now on, no glass of water will be touched until it's been purified. A few months later, Rahman Litzlan, the parts hears that a fire broke out in that little village. And because the homes were of wood and the roofs were made of thatched straw, the blaze caught on from building to building and the entire village, Rahman Litzlan, was razed to the ground. The parts came rushing to inspect his property. And he asked the supervisor, don't you have a volunteer fire brigade? He said, of course we do. And the water was ready to be thrown onto the fire. And then they said, wait, wait, the pirates told us that we have to purify the water. I made a nether that we would not touch one glass of water until it's purified. So until we could purify the water, the entire village, village burnt down. Said the pirates, you're a foolish man. I was talking about bettering yourself, living high quality of life. But when a fire is raging, any water will do. Said the Chavetz Chaim to these 2,000 yeshiva bochum, age 16, 17, and 18. A fire is raging. We're losing korbanis. Any water will do. We have no idea, having children that grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, St. Louis Park, of the kayach of our kids to bring people closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And you will benefit more than anyone else. They become experts on Hilchah Shabbos, experts in Zmiris, experts in Minhagim. They're 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. Vast tracts of knowledge they've absorbed, living in your home, going to Yeshiva, going to Beis Yaakov. And they become energized. They're fighting for a cause. It'll turn your lives around. Tisha B'Av is a time to mourn, but to celebrate the future. Because Tisha B'Av is a day that's called already a Mo'ed, called Mesavel, Yerushalayim, Zoyche Veroya, in the present tense, you see the Geula. It would be Zoyche B'Siyat HaRashmaya, to use these moments of Tisha B'Av wisely, to commit ourselves to bringing others closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Tachas Kanfei HaShchina. And that Tzchus will be Zoyche to the greatest Simcha. The Simcha when we will all rejoice, when the whole world will be filled, Kamayim Layam Achasim, with the idea that there's a Rabbeinu Shalom in the world, the coming of Mashiach Tzidkenu B'Mherav Yameinu. Amen. How many of us have been in the same position as Rabbi Leif? Somebody says something, it sounds a little Jewish and we just pay no attention. But Rabbi Leif didn't do that. He thought about it, rang in his head, and he said, I'm going back. And that's what he did. And the rest of the story unfolds. It happens every day. And it happens to me and it happens to you. The question is, do we let it go by? Or do we do something about it? Just beautiful. Project Inspire is not a cure of organization. It's actually the brainchild of Rav Noach Weinberg, Zechut Tzadik Levracha, who taught us that the assimilation and the intermarriage rates throughout the world are so staggering that it takes an army, a full army, of everyone in Klal Yisrael to try to do something about it. And so was born Project Inspire to try to help people reach out, give you the tools, give you the inspiration to help you reach out to everyone you know, to bring back Achenu Bnei Yisrael. And on that note, we now bring you our feature presentation. And what you're about to watch is a Kirib story. It's a story that spans over a period of many years, and it requires a certain amount of concentration on your part. I know it's Tish above, maybe not so easy to focus, but when you do and you see what's really unfolding, it's something that will change your perception of the power that each one of us has. Take a look. I had the opportunity to fly to Los Angeles and meet with a very special family, and that's really where our story begins today. My couple, 
his son Levi, beautiful family. I learned about their road to Yiddishkeit. But this is not some typical Kirov story. I learned that very quickly. Watch. Um, in my home, there's always a strong Jewish identity, but the actual practice, it was left to occur more at the, at the temple. But was there a Seder at home? Did yeah, we would do, we would, yeah, we would do a, we would do a Seder. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, now that I become acquainted with halacha, it's not, none of these things were halachic. Right. right. Uh, uh, any, any Shabbos at all at home? Or? No, never. Nothing at all. And I mean, I, I, I mean, I wasn't a particularly ignorant person. I mean, I'd graduated law school. I'd traveled around the world, to Israel even. Um, uh, I had, you know, I'd been to 30 countries or so. I'd studied world religions and philosophy. I just... I think that my experience with Reform Judaism had blinded me. I, it gave me the false impression that I actually knew what Judaism was about. Mm -hmm. So I just never opened that door or questioned it. So religious Jews were basically relegated to uh, Amish country, that type of... I thought sense. there was some small, obscure, dying sect out there somewhere. I mean, that's, that's, mm -hmm. what, I, that's what I'd been led to believe, and that's, that's where I'd left the question. Wow. Um, at 35 years old, I was uh, a trial lawyer living in West Hollywood. Um, I have the kind of practice where I like to be in front of juries in court. So other lawyers would bring cases that they thought needed, they wouldn't settle or they had potential real value. Um, and they would bring them to me to do trials. So at that point, um, I think doing trials was a big part of my identity and self-esteem. I hadn't lost and I was on a four-year winning streak. I took all comers. Well. And between that and working out and recreation, traveling around the world, that was pretty much what I was focused on. When I got to my fourth year, in my 36th year, I was closing on four years of wins, um, and I was looking for more business. And my little brother, who had become a Balchuva about five, five years earlier, um, told me that he knew a, an attorney who was an employment lawyer named Michael Eisenberg, and he needed a new trial lawyer. And so I said, that's great. You know, I'm, I'm doing really well right now, I want to meet him. Josh Koppel was uh, one of our favorite guests to have. He was uh, at a local college. And uh, he would tell me, oh, you got to meet my brother, Mike Koppel. He's like this hardcore philosopher, philosophy major, very intense trial lawyer. You got to talk to my brother. He's like tough as nails on this stuff. And uh, he, he, could, he could really use it. My little brother calls me back and said, well, actually, his son is having a bris. Um, he's having a new baby boy, uh, Israel Mayer. He's having a bris, and you should, let's go meet him there. Okay, it almost blew apart from the get-go, because oh. um, it was at Beis Yehuda, and there's always a Hasidah shul, and he comes walking up with his robe and a big furry hat. And I don't know what the look of my face was, but I see my little brother, he gets this panic attack. I said, and I slap him on the chest, I'm like, what's the deal with this guy? Because nobody who dresses like that can have a successful law practice. And as, as I'm like, what's going on, Josh? You, you told me, he says, no, 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 he's very successful. He only dresses like this because of Simcha. It's a, what's that mean, a happy occasion? Hi, how are you doing? We shake hands and, uh, and he says, how are you doing? It's nice to meet you. And he says, yeah, well, we'll talk soon. But you were blown away. You were turned off completely, I mean, I, I assume. Yeah, I was turned off because there must have been some point in my life I've seen a picture of a Hasidic Jew, but I, I'd never seen one within 50 yards. And to be around 100 and him walking up to me, I didn't understand what that was. That did not make any sense to me as a person I could have a conversation with. Well, I followed up with him probably about a day or so later, and we had lunch. And I tell him, you know, I haven't lost in three or four years. And he says his trial lawyer just inherited tons of money and he's gone. Mm -hmm. So he's not, he's not working anymore. Mm -hmm. So he needs a guy who can do that. Perfect, good chef. Yeah, yeah. And, but within three or four minutes, he goes, you know what? What are you doing for dinner Friday night? And I said, that's, that's a Shabbat thing. I said, nah, that's it. He goes, come on for a meal. I said, nah, like, like I'm really, and he had this look on his face that um, like I was a mark, like he was, he was like grinning at me. And I said, what are you, I, I can see the way you're looking at me. What are you, but he was, he was so unrepentant about it. It was kind of funny. Really? Yeah, he was like, like a fox, you know, like yeah. almost daring me to, I say at one point, I'm thinking about it. And again, I'm like, look, we'll build a friendship. That's a great basis for a business relationship. And um, plus, I thought it was kind of funny how brazen he was being, how open. Right. And, first uh, meeting. It's the first time you met him. I know him. I know him now. And he's, he's always looking for Kira. His law firm is a front for Kira. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. <laughs> There's another guy in our law firm who moved in there. He just became religious three months ago. So I, I made one opening. I said, is your wife a good cook? And then he knew I, it was done. He smiles, relaxes, cracks his knuckles, says, the best. That's it. Well, he wasn't lying, by the way. She's an amazing cook. Mm. Um, 
So I came for a Shabbat dinner. The meal at their house that Friday night changed my life. That meal changed my life. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> How does a, me a meal change a life? You, you understand what you're saying? Okay, let's put it this way. I went there for the meal, figuring I'll know his family, I'll build a relationship, business will be smooth. There is, I walked out of that meal not caring about the business, but caring about the fact that um, I got my first taste of what a Torah observant Jew lives like. And that was a form of wealth that was better than anything I could win in a case. And what did he do, Mike? He just kept coming? Yeah, Mike kept coming. He was, uh, he was, he didn't ask me any questions about it. None of that philosophy stuff. No. We just, we just cut to the chase and had, you know, some good food and some laughs and, you know, he really loved my kids and my kids loved him. And, uh, he was a regular at our Shabbos table for a long time. Every Friday night, when, the, when he wouldn't show up, the kids would be very disappointed. He's not coming. Hmm. And, uh, I just, he, he just, uh, he, 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 he really, he, he really connected with, with, uh, with the lifestyle. It was just better than, it wasn't just better than the life I was leading. It was better than any plan I could construct. Uh, so Michael Koppel was doing some trials for us, and we had a lot of fun working together. And I don't recall whether it was, I think I, I may have suggested to him that he take some time off and go to Asia Torah in Jerusalem, because he seemed so interested. And I think we had a lot, we had a lot of conversations about this. And I told him that he'd really have to, if he wanted to take his Judaism to the next level, he'd probably have to go to Yeshiva for a little while. And, you know, he was a sole practitioner, so I knew the folding up his practice could be very detrimental to his business. But I told him even just, you know, a couple few weeks, you know, people, you know, people take time off all the time to do vacations. So just make this into a little vacation. He wanted me to go in December, and I remember thinking, eh, probably January. And that's when we went. He came with me. I did, actually, I actually went with him and uh, kind of introduced him to some people that I uh, knew over there and uh, would visit him every day. He closed up his practice, he left his wife and kids, just to make sure he was watching me as me and my Shomer. I had my own learning schedule that I was doing in Israel, and I'd go to Aish and I'd go, just check up on him, and you know, he'd tell me, but this, oh, you gotta come see Rabbi Berger, he's terrific, or you gotta listen to this. Like, so I'd come with him to these lectures to assure him, and uh, it was great, it was, it was a nice experience. Mahdi Berger, one of his classes was on the Mashiach to show how the prophecies of Isaiah are happening in front of us. Over the last hundred years, you can see it. Now I'm hearing about the vitality and the, the, the presentness of Jewish life and what's about to happen right now and, and the vitality of it. And, and I didn't really need much of, it, uh, of an excuse because I already knew I wanted this life. And at that point I said, that's it, I'm gonna do it. The class ends, I get up and I walk up to him and I say, I'm becoming a Balchuva. So he gives me a big clap on the back, and goes, great kiddo, and he walks out the door. <laughs> now I wasn't expecting to get a parade but he was so nonchalant. That's kind of his thing. That's great. Yeah. No kiddish. No, no nothing. No he's, chalant. No, just, he walks out the door, swings shut. And I'm sitting there. <laughs> Alone. Nobody left. It didn't matter. It was it the bad. It was probably, it was, it was not probably, with the exception of um, choosing my wife uh, or proposing to my wife, it was the best decision I've ever made in my life. And I can't really compare them because they're interrelated. Best decision. All I can tell you is I was a, almost a zero percenter and and now now i've got 50 years to pay that back and i will do it and i will do whatever i can do to help claw yisrael to help my family and to help help in the avoda of hashem it's everything i would have wanted and uh it just even when i made the decision to become Baal Shuba, i didn't i didn't i didn't think within six years i'll be married with three kids i mean that i've been very very blessed tell me about levy he, he's been building his own Shabbos sets, he davens, he's, he, he, he lives this all out now. I, I, it means to me everything. This is what I wanted. What I could never find in the secular world was a way to develop strong moral values and then give them to your kids. And he has them and he'll have them even better than I do. So that to me is everything. You ever look at him and think of Michael Eisenberg and say, wow. Yeah, oh yeah. No, I mean, I look at my wife and I think, I look at Levy, I look at Lior, I look at Tamar. None of it happens without Michael Eisenberg. No question. I mean, it's not even, there's nothing to talk about. He introduced me to her. He introduced me to Torah Judaism. Of course not. And without him, they wouldn't exist. I feel like when I go upstairs when I'm 120, and uh, when they ask me what I've done, 
I think that um, to say that I had this very, this one relationship with Michael Koppel where it was such a profound impact on his life and my life, uh, I think Hashem will be very, very happy with what happened. I think you're right. Incredible. Michael Eisenberg extends an invitation. Mike Koppel says yes, and the rest is history. But the story doesn't end there. You see, Michael Eisenberg was not born with a strimal on his head. So I asked him, what was your upbringing like? I mean, I, I grew up in a conservative synagogue, and you know, my impression of growing up in a conservative synagogue is the Judaism is defined by the Holocaust stories and Israel bonds. You became a you became a lawyer, right? Right. Where did you go to school? I went to I went to University of San Diego Law School. It's a private mm -hmm. school down in San Diego. Right. Not observant. Not. Uh, not at all. Not at all. No. Nothing. Nothing to do with that. And then uh, you found yourself back in Israel somehow, on the University of Tel Aviv. Right. So. Uh, I went on a summer abroad program at Tel Aviv University. And um, my grandfather, you should rest in peace, my grandpa Lou, he was uh, fighting cancer for a couple of years. And when I left that summer, for that summer semester, I knew that that was going to be the last time I saw him. And uh, when I was there, I got the news that my grandpa passed away. And, you know, my, my grandfather only had two daughters, my mom and my aunt. And it troubled me because I know that you're supposed to say Kaddish. For a, for a person who passed away, and I knew I had to do something about this. I couldn't, because my, my mom, who's gonna say Kaddish for my grandpa? So I was on campus that next day, That when I, I heard that night. Next day, it's a Friday, I'm on campus, and I see a, a guy walking with the yarmulke. This guy came up to me, looked approximately my age, and he came up to me and he said, do you speak English? I said, yes, I do. He said, uh, are you Orthodox? I said, yes, I am. I said, can I help you? He said that his grandfather had just passed away and he wanted to know if he could say Kaddish and where he could say Kaddish and the reason he wanted to know if he could say Kaddish was he said that his parents are still Baruch Hashem alive can he say Kaddish I said you know I don't know the answer to that question it's Friday today why don't you come to my shul this evening and we can ask the rabbi that question and you know what why don't you come eat dinner with my parents tonight and uh I was very happy to be invited, so I, so I went. And he, I met his lovely family, his siblings and his parents, and uh, he became like my first religious friend. When I was back in Los Angeles, I got a phone call out of the blue. The last part of my MBA entailed a program in Silicon Valley. And I thought after this period of time in Silicon Valley, I'd never been to California previously, why don't I go down to Los Angeles? The problem was I didn't know anybody in Los Angeles except for one individual, Michael Eisenberg. So I called him, I said, Michael, do you remember me? He said, yes, of course I remember you. I, I said to him, Michael, I'm in, um, I'm, in, I'm in Palo Alto. I would like to come down to LA for a few days. Can I stay with you? He said, sure. I'm happy to host him. I, I, I was very upfront with him. I said, look, you know, I know you're Orthodox. You know, I, I don't keep kosher. I, I don't keep Shabbos. You're here for a week, week and a half. I said, uh, just, you know that going into it, but I'm gonna make it work, so don't worry about it. I'll, f I'll make sure everything's fine. Just, we'll, 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 we'll get through this thing together. So Michael called an organization, I think it's called the Jewish Learning Experience, something like that. That's what it's called. And asked them, or told them, he said, I've got, I've got, a, I've got a friend from Israel, he's Orthodox. We, uh, we would like to know if you could host the two of us for meals on Friday night and, and, and Shabbat lunch. And they did. They put us in touch with two different families. Uh, during the during the lunch the lunch meal, when we were walking home, we met Rabbi Zaret, who is a uh, Kiruv rabbi for from Ashrenu. He met me in the street and asked me twenty questions and uh, found out where I worked, what I did, all the basics. Very short period of time, and we kind of hit it off. It was the first Shabbos that Michael had kept in his life, and it 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 was a powerful experience for him. I finally just sat down with Rabbi Adlestein one day and I said, you've got it all. You've got this amazing wife, beautiful kids, you know, you have such a happiness in life. How do I, how do I get that? And he laid it out. He, he and I had a very, you know, he's a very upfront kind of a guy, which I appreciated. And he told me, he says, you want it? You gotta, you gotta be that yourself. 
You Sign wanna be, up. You want to be a nice Jewish girl, you got to be a nice Jewish boy. And you started to uh, study, and you started to keep Shabbos? Uh, sure. Yeah. You know, the first thing I did was uh, keeping kosher, not eating non-kosher meat, and just, you know, from there, a regular daily learning, just reading everything I could, any kind of book on Judaism, just, you know, R.A. Kaplan books, getting the basics, the basic foundations of Judaism down. You I, developed a relationship, and I, I, Rabbi, I, 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 I didn't open up a safer to, right. to, to learn with Michael. I, it's not like I said, let's learn Mishnah or let's learn Gemara, let me teach you Halacha. I didn't do that at all with him. I think he he observed. We, we, we spent time together, but it was more about friendship. It might be fair to say that had he not been there that day, had you not thought about Kaddish and saw a friendly face walking by, I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? You ever think about that? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm very, uh, I'm very thankful to him that he, uh, he took an inst he took me under his wing, and uh, like I said, really made like my problem his problem, and tried to get to the bottom of it. So I, I, I really don't think I did very much. So here I was. I had met with my couple. I met Michael Eisenberg. You heard the story like I did. Unbelievable. And then Clive Lipschitz, and he's trying to tell me that what he did was really nothing. But what I was about to show him would change his perception of what happened forever. So I'm just going to show you this. I'm going to show you this picture here and ask you, do you know this man? No. Could you, could you look again real closely and tell me if you know him? Do you know, do you know the child sitting next to him? No. Looks like a from kid, but I, I don't know their family. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard the name Mike Koppel? Never. You've never heard my, of Mike Koppel? Never. I, I don't know who Mike Koppel is. You don't know who Mike Koppel is? <laughs> I don't know Mike Koppel. I don't exactly know how to describe him. Let me ask you this. You know this man. That's Michael. He took he took me under his wing, and uh, like I said, really made like my problem his problem, and tried to get to the bottom of it. So him, you know, sure. Well, Mike Koppel, yeah, and Michael Eisenberg, right, are very very close friends. Okay, very nice. If not for Michael Eisenberg. Mike Koppel, who you see in that picture, would not be there. And if not for Michael Eisenberg, that little boy sitting next to Mike Koppel would not be there. Okay. Because Michael Eisenberg right. was the Clive Lipschitz to Mike Koppel. Wow. This passes on. That's unbelievable. That really is incredible. Are you getting a chill? Yeah, I am right you now. Me too. <laughs> wow. Take another look at that of Mike Koppel. <clears throat> nice. Beautiful. Wonderful. Look at that kid. From kid. Levy. But Mike Koppel was just like Michael Eisenberg before you came along. Wow. That's incredible. I think so. That is really incredible. So, Levy and Mike, they're your kids too. <laughs> That's an incredible story, Rabbi. Yeah. I think so. How wow. does it does it make you feel? <clears throat> it's powerful. It's powerful because you can see, it's almost like you can feel a tiny little act here leads to another act, leads to another act, leads to another act. That's almost how this continues. That is incredibly powerful. 
And I guess what this tells you is Mike Koppel may himself influence somebody else. The ball rolls on. You said it. Snowball. You said it better than I could. Right. That's, that is incredible. I never thought of it that way before. And it really st started off with such a minor chance, and there's no chance in life, but it started off with such a minor act. I feel that in Michael, and Mike as well, for sure, there was this spark that just needed to get lit and released. Right. It doesn't take that much. No. No, it doesn't. Every single viewer, whether there's 50,000 or 100,000 people watching this and is thinking, you know, well, I really make a difference. And you're telling them live from your experience, as you just said it, in a way that I could never have done, said I never opened a safer with him. Right. There are some people who would want to do it that way, and right. that's wonderful. Right. You just shared your life. This was just, honestly, this was just friendship. Do you know that Michael Eisenberg is, is a Kirov machine? I have, I have subsequently learned this. He, he lives for helping others. He lives for showing everyone the beauty of Yiddishkeit. Some people have said that his law office is a front <laughs> for the Kirov movement that he heads. <laughs> I'm sure he's a successful lawyer. There may be some truth to this too. Right, right. Do you know what the license plates are mm -hmm. in his car? I love Yidden is the one, and I love Hashem is the other. Mm -hmm. I, I, I realized this was a different Michael. And it, it all started from, you didn't shrug him off. You just said, let's meet the rabbi and ask. And then you said, I just want to be your friend. <laughs> this is incredible. I, I, I never thought about it this way, but this is an incredible story. I think so. You can't help but think so. Incredible. I sat with Clive, as you saw, and I understood, and I was moved by the fact that he did something that he thought was very small. But he seized the opportunity, and look what it became. Le Deire Deiris, and he had absolutely no idea. Michael Eisenberg, he seized the opportunity too. Clive Lipschitz, he sees the opportunity. As a matter of fact, Rabbi Leaf, he also sees the opportunity. And none of them had any idea about how great the things we do can actually become. That is today's message. Rabbi Chaim Volozhner says in Nefesh HaChaim that a person is not allowed to say, who am I? What can I do? I'm but a small person an individual, we're not allowed to do that. We have to see ourselves as great. We have to see our actions as great. We have to see the potential of every single thing that we do as being as enormous as changing the entire world because that's the truth. That's what Tisha B'Av is really all about. Tisha B'Av is not about intensifying our despair over the past. It's about inspiring us for the future. We can take Tisha B'Av, a day of mourning for nearly 2,000 years, and turn it into a colossal Kiddush Hashem. That's our job. That's what we need to take away from this story today. We need to understand that we are great we are great people. We have greatness within each one of us. And those small things, by taking those little chances, the little opportunities, can make all the difference in the world. Where do I fit in? What can I do? I'm inspired. I understand. I see that little things can become big things. But what can I actually do? So let's talk tachlis, shall we? First of all, you must realize that the opportunities all around you are endless. Every day, you and I, we're meeting people. 
but we ignore the opportunities. We let them go by without realizing that a small hello, a simple handshake, saying hello to somebody can begin a relationship. Sharing a website with them, teaching them a little bit Torah, giving them an experience of Shabbos or a chasana, Hanukkah, whatever it may be. Any little small tidbit of Yiddishkeit can create generations of people who are Shemir Torah mitzvahs. The truth is, you could be the next Clive Lipschitz. You could be the next Michael Eisenberg. Doesn't take much, you know that. You just need to try. And in addition, you may have heard about the Shabbos Project. It began last year in South Africa. Thousands of people who never had any shaykhs, no connection to Torah or mitzvahs, got together and experienced the Shabbos together. Well, this year it's starting again. The Shabbos Project is in Parshas Noyach, October 25th. Worldwide, people will try to get people involved who have never been involved before, and you can be a big part of that. Project Inspire has partnered with Shabbos around the world to be able to create this Shabbos experience. Find somebody who's never experienced in Shabbos and bring them into the fold. It's really not that difficult. And if you ask, but I don't know anybody. I really don't have the opportunity. I don't know the people. Who am I going to invite? Well, October 25th is a few months away. But how about Rosh Hashanah? Contact Project Inspire to give an easy outreach gift for Rosh Hashanah. It's a few dollars. It can change someone's life. It can change your own life. Sukkot comes. We have the Project Inspire Sukkot initiative. Just bring somebody into a sukkah for the first time. Truth is, they love it. They have a wonderful time. It's a great experience. And by the time Pasha Snoach rolls around, you'll have a whole host of people who will want to be a part of that very special Shabbos experience. There's a lot you can do. This Tisha B'Av, make the resolve, challenge yourself. Say to yourself right now, I want to be a part of this. I can do a lot in the merit in the schus of all the things that we take upon ourselves today on Tisha B'Av. May HaKadosh Baruch Hu bring bracha, simcha, hatzlacha in all of our lives and bring the binyan bayis shlishi v'mheira of yamenu. Amen. Project Inspire would like to thank our generous partners and sponsors for their ongoing support and for making this year's Tisha B'Av presentation possible. Gourmet Glot of Cedarhurst and Brooklyn, worth the trip from anywhere. Funding Resources Mortgage Corporation, we put the truth in lending. May the chizuk and inspiration of this year's film presentation be Le'iloi Nishmas, Iyal ben Uriel, Yaakov Naftali ben Avram, and Gilad Michael ben Ophir, Hashem Yinkoim Damam. This year's presentation is L'schus Refur Shalema for Tzila Bas Chana, B'Soich Sha'ar Chayle Yisrael.